Darwin's Doubt, presentation number six. The book Darwin's Doubt was written by Steve Meyer, who is author of Signature in the Cell, which is a very good book in its own right. We've reviewed it before. Um, he was originally an oil industry geophysicist with a master's in uh, geology. Uh, and he became interested in the origin of life at first and then generally the information question and got his PhD from Cambridge, England, uh, Cambridge University, the philosophy of science. He is currently the director for science of the Center for Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute. And he actually wrote a, an article that uh, uh, went over this uh, material before in the Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington and um, there's a considerable controversy on that. Uh, the book itself is divided into three main parts and I'm actually quoting the prologue here. Part one, the mystery of the missing fossils. Part two, how to build an animal. And part three, after Darwin, what? We're in the middle of part two, how to build an animal. And uh, just to review, we went through in part one, the mystery of the missing fossils, and my own summary of his thought. The sudden appearance of multiple life forms in the Cambrian was a major unsolved problem for Darwin, and the problem has <coughs> only grown worse with the discovery of the Burgess Shale and the Changjing fossils. The excuse that the pre precursors were soft-bodied and therefore not preserved has been refuted by the evidence. And he went through a lot of evidence in that particular regard. It claims that intermediates are really there, are lacking evidence and not believed by most authorities. Genetics seems to demand intermediates if common descent is assumed. Uh, the tree of life cannot be used as a counterbalance to the problem of the Cambrian explosion because it has its own problems and punctuated equilibrium cannot explain the Cambrian explosion um, because it requires also a tree just like uh, standard Darwinian theory. The reason why the Cambrian explosion is a challenge for Darwinian, we're now into part two is that Darwinism has to explain the origin of massive amounts of information, not just Shannon information, um, which is a mathematical uh, proposition of information, but also functional information. There has always been doubt that Darwinism was up to the job. There has always been doubt that Darwinism was up to the job. That is to say, probably wasn't. But the work of Yaki and later Sauer have made the job more daunting. And now we're going to look at uh, the rest, or uh, more of part two. And the, the, uh, the article entitled The Origin of Genes and Proteins. And follow up on some work on, uh, by Douglas Axe, who many of you have met before in the uh, book uh, uh, Science and Human Origins, uh, but um, who uh, followed up on the work of uh, Yaki and Sauer. And again, unless marked otherwise, uh, what I'll be reading is uh, the words of the book straight out. Where I comment, I'll usually put green background behind it. And uh, except for my comments at the end, which are clearly labeled. And um, this is the Reader's Digest version. We will not just read the two chapters, but I'll be skipping through, uh, trying to hit the highest points. Um, if you want the rest of it, I strongly urge you to read the book. It is actually a very good and well-written book. As a PhD student in chemical engineering at the California Institute of Technology in the late 1980s, Douglas Axe, and we're not going to show the figure, uh, became interested in evolutionary theory after several 
fellow graduate students read the then best-selling book by Richard Dawkins, The Blind Watchmaker. Axe's compatriots were quickly converted to zealous advocates of Darwin's arguments and urged him to read the book for himself. Axe was impressed by the clarity of Dawkins' writing and illustrations, but he found his case for the creative power of natural selection and random mutations unpersuasive. Whether in the analogies he drew to animal breeding or the computer simulations he used to demonstrate the supposed ability of mutation and selection to generate new genetic information, Dawkins repeatedly smuggled in the very thing he insisted the concept of natural selection expressly precluded, the guiding hand of an intelligent agent. He found Dawkins' computer simulation particularly interesting. In The Blind Watchmaker, Dawkins described how he had programmed a computer to generate the Shakespearean phrase, methinks it is like a weasel. Dawkins did this in order to, stimulate, uh, to simulate how random mutations and natural selections could generate new functional information. Dawkins programmed the computer first to generate many separate strings or sequences of English letters. He then programmed it to compare each string to the Shakespearean target phrase and select only the string that most closely resembled that target. The program then generated variant versions of the newly selected strings and compared those sequences to the target, selecting again only the one that most closely resembled the desired target. This eventually generated, after many iterations, a string that matched the target perfectly. Um, I'll editorialize on that. Many generations, uh, I think the shortest was 43 or something like that, and it could take a a hundred or more, but it is not in the millions and billions of generations that uh, would be expected if you simply had to type it from scratch and then see if it fit perfectly. And that was Dawkins' point. If you can <coughs> gradually think, keep things going along a pathway, you dramatically shorten the uh, course of time in trying to find, get from one point to another. Axe recognized immediately the role that Dawkins' own intelligence had played. Not only did Dawkins provide the program with the information that he wanted it to generate, he thinks it is like a weasel, so he had a target, which he insists uh, that life does not, but he imbued the computer with a kind of foresight by directing it to compare the variant sequence of letters with the desired target. That is to see how close the information is. And you see, uh, evolution is supposed to judge what the body looks like, um, not what the sequence is. And if the, if the body and the sequence always correspond, that's one thing. But if the, if the body doesn't correspond unless the sequence gets very, very close, then in the meantime, it's left wandering around trying to find uh, the right sequence. So he imbued the computer with a kind of foresight by directing it to compare the variant sequences of letters with the desired target. Axe realized the Dawkins program did not simulate natural selection by which definition is neither guided, which by definition is neither guided towards nor given information about a desired outcome generations in the future. And we're going to skip over some. <coughs> Axe realized that Dawkins was right about one thing, the importance of genetic information. Like his fellow engineer, Murray Eden, Axe's tendency to view biology as an engineer led him to ask whether selection and mutation could actually build new organisms. Axe's own research explored the connection between process control, a field of study in engineering, and genetic regulation, a sophisticated version of automated process control at work on a molecular scale inside living cells. Since cells use proteins to pr perform various feats of regulation, Axe was acutely aware that building new organisms necessarily involved building new proteins, which would in turn require new genetic information. Unresolved issues. As Axe read the papers that Sauer's research group had produced, Um, he realized their importance as a first step towards answering the questions Murray Eden had raised at Wistar. 
if Sauer's quantitative measurement measures of rarity held up, the next thought it would be it, it obvious that mutation and selection could not adequately search a space that large. If, on the other hand, subsequent mutagenesis experiments overturned Sauer's work and showed that protein function was largely indifferent to changes in amino acid sequence, then the number of functional sequences might be large enough that mutation and selection would have a good chance of finding new functional genes and proteins in a reasonable amount of time. After completing his PhD, Axe was invited by Alan First, a professor at the University of Cambridge and director of the Center for Protein Engineering, part of the world famous Medical Research Council Center at Cambridge, to join his research group. Specifically, Axe wanted to eliminate what he saw as two sources of error in Sauer's method. X thought first that Sauer's team might have underestimated the rarity of functional proteins. In their experiments, Sauer's group tested the tolerance of proteins to amino acid substitution by changing amino acids at one time, or at one or a few consecutive sites, without making any other changes to other sites at the same time. Sauer and his colleagues found that many sites along a protein change ch chain could tolerate these isolated amino acid substitution. Sauer's team seemed to be assuming that a similar tolerance would have emerged if they had changed many sites simultaneously. In other words, it is possible that if you change amino acid A, it still works, and you change amino acid B, it still works, but if you change both of them, you lose the function. And that's the question that uh, Axe was asking. Axe wondered whether multiple as opposed to single pro position changes would quickly degrade function and whether a tolerance for substitutions at individual sites was itself context dependent. Whether the tolerance for substitution at one site might depend on having highly specific sequences at other sites. Thus, without questioning Sauer's experimental findings, Axe thought Sauer's results lent itself to misinterpretation. As it turns out, Sauer recognized the potential for misinterpretation of his results in the paper. As he explained in that paper, um, this calculation overestimates the number of functional sequences, since changes at individual positions are less likely to be independent of one another as more po positions are allowed to vary. Another assumption in Sauer's approach had potentially the opposite effect, exaggerating the rarity of functional proteins. Axe thought the test that Sauer and his colleagues used to decide whether their mutant proteins were functional required a higher level of function than natural selection might require. Sauer and his team judged proteins with less than about 5 to 10 percent of the function seen in the natural protein to be non-functional. But supposing it was 1 percent, it still might be functional enough to serve the cell. Yet Axe knew that even damaged enzymes with less than 5% of normal activity could add significantly more benefit than no enzymatic activity at all. Thus, from a neo-Darwinian point of view, the emergence of even such handicapped proteins might confer a selectable advantage to an organism over one that didn't have a protein at all. Axe thought that by rejecting as non-functional such mutated sequences, Sauer's team probably had introduced another estimation error. These competing errors made it hard to know if the estimate made by Sauer's team was too high or too low or whether perhaps they might neatly cancel each other out. The importance of folds. Axe wanted to focus on the problem problem of the origin of new protein folds and the genetic information necessary to produce them as a critical test of the neo-Darwinian mechanism. Proteins comprise at least three distinct levels of structure, primary, secondary, and tertiary, the latter corresponding to a protein fold. The specific sequence of amino acids in a protein and polypeptide chain make up its primary structure. The recurring structural motifs such as alpha helices and beta strands and it will be easier to see this on the figure next, uh, that arise from specific sequences of amino acids constitute its secondary structure. The, large, the larger folds or domains that form from these secondary structures are called tertiary structures. 
And here's the illustration. Amino acids are all chained together this way. And an alpha helix happens to have the CO of one bond matched with the NH of the other by hydrogen bonding. And so it has a specific turn. And it's often kind of illustrated in this uh, a helix kind of way. Beta sheets, on the other hand, if they're laying more or less flat, um, have CO and H2 bonds that happen to match each other as well. Um, CO and, I'm sorry, and NH bonds that happen to match each other as well. Uh, again, giving a hydrogen bond between the two. And except in this time, instead of going around in a helix, they tend to go in flat rows. They can go in either direction. Uh, but because they tend to form that kind of plated sheet, they tend to hold a certain part of the molecule together. Now, once the molecule has multiple uh, beta sheets and uh, alpha helices, uh, the amino acids between tend to be kind of pulled into a particular formation. And so the whole thing uh, kind of locks into place, so to speak. Explosions of new life forms must have involved bursts of new protein folds as well, because you need new protein folds to make enzymes that do certain kinds of new actions. The late, at least as far as we can tell, and that's held up pretty well. The late geneticist and evolutionary biologist Susumu Ono, uh, who, by the way, invented the term um, junk DNA noted <coughs> that Cambridge and Cambrian animals required complex new proteins, such as, for example, lysyl oxidase, in order to support their stout body structures. When these molecules originated in the Cambrian animals, they also likely represented a completely novel folded structure, unlike anything present in Precambrian forms of life, such as sponges or one-celled organisms. Could random mutations generate such novel protein folds? Axe realized that in, an in answering this question depended on the measuring the rarity of functional genes and proteins in sequence space and determining whether random genetic mutations would have enough opportunities to search the relevant sequence spaces within evolutionary time. And as you can imagine, that's a huge job trying to figure out which enzyme or which structures will have enough enough structure in them to uh, produce enzymes. Axe's initial results. Axe read the paper by Sauer and his colleague John Reedhauer Olson that estimated the proportion of functionality, functional protein sequences to be extremely low, 1 in 10 to the 63rd power. He noticed that the authors chose not to emphasize this measure of rarity, however, but instead the variety of amino acid substitutions that the protein could, under study could tolerate. The <coughs> glass isn't 99% empty, it's actually 1% full. And of course, that's a slight exaggeration. It's actually worse than that. In their paper, Reed Harrelson and Sauer also repeated a then popular idea that the amino acids buried in the interior of a folded protein forming what is known as the hydrophobic core, are most important for specifying the structure, while the arrangement of the exterior amino acids did not matter nearly as much. In fact, some protein scientists thought that these simple restrictions might be the whole story, that a functional protein might require nothing more than an appropriate arrangement of hydrophobic and hydrophilic amino acids in a given sequence. At first lab in Cambridge, Axe concluded an experimental test of this idea and surprised himself with the first result. In a paper he co-authored in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 1996, he reported his findings. When he replaced the entire 13 residue hydrophobic core of a small enzyme with random combinations of other hydrophobic amino acids, A high fraction of the randomized proteins, about one-fifth, still performed in their, origi their original function. <coughs> I mean, mo 
most of them were destroyed, but that's a very high fraction uh, to expect. <coughs> Bye. I'm going to have to bring some water next time. Um, this suggested that proteins were perhaps less susceptible to functional loss as a result of sequence changes. Next, he focused on the exterior proteins, randomized, randomizing portions of the two different proteins' exteriors in much the same way that he had randomly changed the interior of one of them. This time, his approach failed to produce any functional variants at all. Realizing that this se seemed to contradict what Sauer and others had supposed, Axe decided to make only much more restrictive changes in the next trial. He replaced each exterior amino acid residue only with its most similar amino acid alternative. So that perhaps if you had glutamic acid, you'd substitute aspartic acid. Or if you had lysine, you'd substitute arginine. and not tryptophan or histidine or glutamic acid. Nevertheless, both of the proteins that he studied still lost all function by the time he had replaced one-fifth of their exterior residues. Contrast that with the interior where you could re replace the whole thing and a fifth of proteins would work. Thus, he concluded that the exterior parts of the proteins were much more susceptible to functional loss as a result of amino acid changes than had been widely assumed. Axe's more sensitive screen also enabled him to establish that even though single mutations allowed many proteins to retain some function, they still diminished or damaged the function of the protein. Well, thank you very much. <coughs> often enough to ensure that they will be eliminated by the purifying effect of natural selection. Further, because of the extreme sensitivity of his, this test, his test for function, Axe learned that any single mutation that failed his test was single-handedly destroying function. He determined that fully 5% of such changes did destroy protein function. That is, in those five areas, you couldn't change that amino acid for anything else. It had to be precisely the one that was there. It appeared that Sauer's two estimation errors, ignoring context and using an insufficiently sensitive screen for function, did, in fact, roughly cancel each other out. Axe was now in a position to answer that question with unprecedented rigor. Once he did, he could determine whether random genetic changes would have enough opportunities, even on the scale of evolutionary time, to search the relevant sequence spaces for functional genes and proteins. So now he goes at it. That is, to adopt Dawkins' visual analogy, mutation in natural selection could conceivably generate a new functional gene starting from either A, another mountain peak, that is to say a different pre-existing functional gene, or B, <coughs> from the valley floor, a non-functional section of the genome. It acts as experimental results which show that the action of natural selection would not help solve the search problem confronting mutation, the mutation mechanism in either of these two cases. To see why, we need to understand a bit more about each of these two possible neo-Darwinian scenarios as well as acts as sub subsequent experimental findings. From peak to peak, that is, if you're starting from one um, enzyme and going to another. In the first case, evolutionary biologists might envision mutation and selection gradually altering a pre-existing gene in its protein product to produce another functional gene and a different protein product. This scenario involved moving metaphorically from one functional peak to another without dipping into a valley that is, a zone, a zone of diminished fitness or non-function. Most evolutionary biologists reject this first scenario, and for good reason. Axis mutagenesis experiments confirm these reasons for doubting the first of possible you know, neo-Darwinian scenarios, at least as an explanation for the origin of new protein folds. In work that he published in 2000, he showed that it is indeed exceedingly difficult to make extensive changes to functional amino acid sequences 
without destabilizing a protein fold. X had a more fundamental reason for considering the first evolutionary scenario implausible, besides just that you lose function. Based on the physical principles of protein function, the vast majority of protein functions simply cannot be performed by unfolded proteins. You really need it all into a nice tight little bundle that uh, has specific designs on it uh, to match what you're trying to hold together to make the enzyme work. In other words, stability of protein structure is a precondition of protein function. Destabilized proteins not folds not only lose the three-dimensional structures they need to perform functional tasks, they are also vulnerable to attack by other proteins called proteases that devour unfolded proteins or polypeptides in the cell. So once it comes unraveled, the body just cuts it in little pieces and recycles it, basically. Um, but if you do that, you lose the protein. This scenario involves not so much a climb up Mount Improbable, but a step out over Valley Impassable. That is, you can't get from here to there unless there's a ridge that you can walk along. And the problem is there isn't one. Now, what about going the other way? Scaling Mount Improbable? For all these reasons, like most evolutionary biologists, Axe thought the second neo-Darwinian scenario in which new genes and proteins emerge from non-functional or neutral regions of the genome provides a much more plausible means of producing the information ne necessary to construct novel protein folds. But this scenario faces an overriding problem. The extreme rarity of sequences capable of forming stable folds and form performing biological functions. Since natural selection does nothing to help generate new folded functional sequences, but rather can only preserve such sequences once they've arisen, random mutations alone must search for the exceedingly rare folded and functional sequences within the vast sea of combinatorial possibilities. That is, you don't have a program that will say, well, how close are we? It's a not how close are we, but does the protein function? And that is the big story associated with Axe experiments. His research showed that folded functional sequences of amino acids are indeed exceedingly rare within sequence space. After his initial round of experiments, Axe performed another series of site-directed mutagenesis experiments on 150 amino acid protein folding domain within a beta lactamase enzyme and published the results in the Journal of Molecular Biology You'll notice that this is peer-reviewed literature. Axe estimated the number of 150 amino acid long sequences capable of folding into stable function-ready folded structures as opposed to the whole set of possible amino acid sequences of that length. Based on his site-directed mutagenesis experiments, he determined that ratio to be a vanishingly small 1 in 10 to the 74th power. In other words, for sequences of 150 amino acids long, only 1 in 10 to the 74 sequences will be capable of folding into a stable protein at all. And this is not asking whether it does a job. This is just saying, will it even fold so that it can do the job? Axe also estimated, A, the number of proteins of modest length, 150 residues, that formed a specific function via any folded structure compared to B, the whole sequence the whole set of possible amino acid sequences of that size. So basically, he's asking, well, how many of these perform any function whatsoever now that they're folded? Based on his experiments and data about the number of stable folded proteins that exist, Axe estimated that ratio to be about 1 in 10 to the 77th. That is to say, about 1,000 times uh, as many folded proteins as you have proteins that actually do something. the biological universal probability bound. Here, evolutionary it's, uh, theory itself provides the answer. If uh, natural selection can only act on the new sequence of bases that is actually passed on to offspring. So we don't have to worry about mutations in the right arm or the left leg or the, or the brain. It's only the ones that, uh, that are in the gonads for humans. 
Only those mutations in the genes or DNA in the reproductive cells of parent organisms can have any effect on the next generation. Any other mutations die with the organism. Based on the average length of time of a bacterial generation, so we're going to stick with bacteria now instead of with uh, higher organisms. And the time since the first appearance of bacterial life on Earth, about 3.8 billion years ago in the conventional dating system, scientists have estimated that a total of uh, 10, about 10 to the 40 organisms have appeared on life since life first appeared. Uh, I'm sorry, on Earth since life first appeared. This was an extremely generous assumption. And there are all kinds of reasons for thinking it isn't quite that many. 10 to the 40th represents only a tiny fraction, 1, 10, trillion, trillion, trillionth of 10 to the se uh, 77. Thus, the conditional probability of generating a gene sequence capable of producing a novel protein fold and function is still, after you chop off the 10 to the 40th tries, you still are 1 in 10 to the 37th which is an extremely small number. Yet Axe's calculations only hint at the full problem for neo-Darwinian theory. His figures vastly understate the improbability of building a Cambrian animal. First, the Cambrian explosion as dated by fossil evidence took far less time than has elapsed since the origin of life on Earth until the present, about 3.8 billion years. In other words, Instead of 3.8 billion years, we're looking at uh, the conventional of five, maybe 10, if you believe some people, million years. About a thousandth, a uh, little over a thousandth of the time. Second, bacteria are by far the most common type of organisms included in Axe's estimate of the total number of organisms that lived on Earth. Yet no one thinks that Cambrian animals evolved directly from bacteria. They probably came from some other, uh, assuming that they came from anything, of course, uh, from some other more organized and slower growing uh, uh, creature. Third, building new animal forms requires generating far more than just one protein of modest length. New Cambrian animals would have required proteins much longer than 150 amino acids to perform necessary specialized functions. Lysyl oxidase, which is used to bind uh, collagen together, among other things, uh, has over 400 amino acids. So you know, we're underestimating all kinds of things here. Richard Dawkins has noted that scientific theories can rely on only so much luck before they cease to be credible, which is, I think, a nice admission. Natural selection cannot play a role until new functional information-bearing molecules have independently arisen. That is to say, natural, natural selection does not call them into being. It's simply uh, once they occur, it allows them to live and take over uh, the ecological niche where they are. Thus, neo-Darwinism neo -Darwin, neo -Darwinism does not explain the Cambrian information explosion. And we are now moving into the next chapter. So uh, his point is that Doug Axe's uh, Research pretty much makes it impossible to get from um, algae or whatever the first organism was to all of the Cambrian animals within a period of uh, five million years or, or so. When I first heard that Douglas Axe had succeeded in making a rigorous estimate of the rarity of proteins in sequence space, I wondered what neo-Darwinists would say in response. Given the experimental rigor and mathematical precision of the work he, he reported in the Molec Journal of Molecular Biology in 2004, that's his last one that has been discussed, and the long odds against mutation and selection ever finding a novel gene or functional protein, what could they say? Yet defenders of the adequacy of the neo-Darwinian mechanism were far from admitting de defeat, as I would soon find out. 
<clears throat> the same year, 2004, Doug Axe published his last stuff. I, that is uh, Steve Meyer, published a peer-reviewed scientific article about the Cambrian explosion and the problem of the origin of biological information needed to explain it. That's the one that I had reference to at the beginning of uh, uh, our presentation today. In the paper, I cited Axe's, res Axe's results and explained why the rarity of functional proteins in sequence space posed such a severe challenge to the adequacy of the neo-Darwinian mechanism. The article appeared in a biology journal, Proceedings of the Biological Society of Washington, published out of the Smithsonian Institution. So that's Washington, D.C., not Washington State. And by scientists working for the Smithsonian's National Muse Museum of Natural History. Because the article also argued that the theory of intelligent design could help explain the origin of biological information, its publication created a firestorm of controversy. Wonder what would happen if he had not put that uh, possibility and just left the question hanging. Museum scientists and evolutionary biologists from around the country were furious with the journal and its editor, Richard Sternberg, for allowing the article to be peer reviewed and then published. Recriminations followed. Museum officials took away Sternberg's keys, his office, and his access to scientific samples. He was transferred from a friendly to a hostile supervisor. A congressional subcommittee staff later investigated and found that the museum, initials, uh, museum officials initiated an intentional information campaign against Sternberg in an attempt to get him to resign. In other words, created a hostile environment, that's what it boiled down to. His detractors circulated false rumors. Sternberg has no degrees in biology. Actually, he had two, count them, two PhDs, one in evolutionary biology and one in systems biology. He's a priest, not a scientist. Of course, Sternberg is not a priest, but a research scientist. I believe he's Jewish. Um, he is a Republican operative working for the Bush campaign. He was far too busy by doing scientific research to be involved in political campaigns, Republican or otherwise. He's taken money to publish the article. Not true. And so on. Eventually, despite the demonstrable falsehood of the charges, he was demoted. Major news stories about the controversy appeared in Science, Nature, The Scientist, and The Chronicle of Higher Education. Then articles appeared in the mainstream press, including the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. A major story aired on national public radio. Sternberg himself even appeared on the O'Reilly Factor. Despite the intense fear, there was no formal scientific response to my article, Steve Myers. And neither the proceedings nor any other scientific journal published a scientific refutation. The members of the Council of the Biological Society of Washington who oversaw the publication of the journal insisted they didn't want to dignify it by responding. It just doesn't exist. <clears throat> this is not the paper you are looking for. Eventually, two scientists and a science education policy advocate, each associated with the National Center for Science Education, a group that lobbies for teaching evolution in the public schools, stepped forward. The three authors, geologist Alan Gishlick, education policy advocate Nicholas Matsky, and wildlife biologist Wesley Ellsbury, published a response to uh, Meyer's article on talkreason.org, a prominent atheistic website. Although the website's guidelines prohibit ad hominem arguments, the rule was somewhat loosely enforced in the case of Gishlik, Matsky, and Ellsbury's response, which they entitled Meyer's Hopeless Monster. Gishlik, Matsky, and Ellsbury attempted to refute his central argument by citing a scientific paper that they said solved the problem of the origin of genetic information. The paper, a scientific review essay titled The Origin of New Genes, Glimpses from the Young and Old, had appeared in Nature Reviews Genetics in 2003. Gishlik, Matsky, and Ellsbury assisted, asserted that this paper, co-authored by Manuan Long, 
an evolutionary biologist at the University of Chicago, and several colleagues, was representative of a, an extensive scientific literature documenting the origin of, of new genes. Other biologists echoed Gishlik, Matsky, and Albert Ellsbury's claims in, a claim in the context of the 2005 Kitzmiller versus Dover trial about an ill-advised attempt to require teachers in a Pennsylvania school district to read a statement about intelligent design. Notice that Steve Meyer and the Discovery Institute had argued against their trying to enforce this. Once upon a gene. The off-cited long paper points to a variety of studies that purport to explain the evolution of various genes. These studies typically begin by taking a gene and then seeking to find other genes that are similar or what they call homologous to it. Then they, they seek to trace the history of slightly different homologous genes back to a hypothetical common ancestor gene or genes. To do this, the, survey, the studies survey databases of gene sequences looking for similar sequences and representatives of different taxonomic groups, often in closely related species. Some studies also attempt to establish the existence of a common ancestor gene on the basis of similar genes within the very same organism. They then typically propose evolutionary scenarios in which an ancestral gene duplicates itself and then the duplicate and the original evolve differently to give you two different genes or three different or four different or however many it is um, as a result of subsequent mutations in each gene. That these scenarios depend on various inferences and postulations doesn't by itself disqualify them from consideration. Nevertheless, whether they adequately explain the origin of genetic information depends upon the evidence for the existence of the entities they infer, the ancestral genes, and the plausibility of the mutational mechanisms they postulate. How much mutation do you have to have? And are the intermediates non-functional? Let's look at both, of the, both parts of these scenarios. Common ancestor genes. Nearly all the scenarios developed in a paper that Long cites start with an inferred common ancestral gene from which two or more modern genes diverged and developed. These scenarios treat the similarity of the sequence, the information, in two or more genes as unequivocal evidence for a common ancestral gene. As I noted in chapters 5 and 6, standard methods of phylogenetic reconstruction presuppose rather than demonstrate that biological similarity results from shared ancestry. It could result, of course, from shared design. Yet, as we saw in Chapter 6, similarity of sequences by itself is not always an unequivocal in indicator of common ancestry. Sometimes similarity appears between species where it cannot be explained by inheritance from a common ancestor. For example, the similar forelimbs on moles and mole crickets. And at the very least, there are other possible explanations for sequence similarity. Orphan genes. <coughs> Some genes and the information-rich sequences they contain most certainly cannot be explained by reference to the kind of scenarios that Long cites. All of these scenarios attempt to explain the origin of two similar genes by reference to descent with modification via mutation from common ancestral genes. Yet genomic studies are now turning up hundreds of thousands of genes in many diverse organisms that exhibit no significant similarity in sequence to any other known gene. And now that we're able to sequence entire genes, they can't hide anywhere. It isn't a matter that we just don't know. We know the human genome. We know, for example, the chimpanzee genome, probably 90 plus percent of it. Uh, some small technical glitches are still being ironed out. Uh, <coughs> These taxonomically restricted genes are orphans for open reading frame, ORF, of unknown origin. Now adopt the phylogenetic landscape. These would be genes, for example, that might be found in humans that are not found in chimpanzees or gorillas or orangutans or monkeys or mice or anything else. They're just in humans only. 
Some might argue that as bi uh, biologists map the sequence of more and more genomes and add more and more gene sequences to protein databases, homologs of these orphans will eventually turn up, thus gradually eliminating the mystery surrounding the orphan phenomenon. Yet to date, the trend has gone in the opposite direction. And if we completely do the gorilla and orangutan and perhaps rhesus monkey or something like that, there will be no place to hide after that. The long essay highlights seven main mutational mechanisms that work in the sculpting of new genes. One, exon shuffling. Two, gene duplication. Three, retropositioning of messenger RNA transcripts, turning it around. Four, lateral gene transfer from some other organism, which of course won't work for orth orphan genes. Um, five, transfer of mobile genetic units or elements. Six, gene fission or fusion. And seven, perhaps most fascinating, de novo origination. <laughs> Yet each of these mechanisms, with the exception of de novo generation, begins with pre-existing genes or extensive sections of genetic text. You have to find those things. Evolution ex nihilo. <laughs> Interesting title. Long does cite at least one type of mutation that does not presuppose existing genetic information. That's the de novo origination of new genes. For example, one paper he discusses sought to explain the origin of a promoter region for a gene. That's the part of the gene that helps initiate the transcription of the gene's instructions. And found that this unusual regulatory region did not really evolve. Instead, it somehow snapped into being. It was aboriginal, created de novo by the fortuitous juxtaposition of suitable sequences. There you have it. The, re the presence of unique gene sequences forces researchers to invoke the de novo origin of genes more often than they would like. After one study of fruit flies reported that as many as 12% of the newly emerged genes in the Drosophila uh, melanogaster subgroup may have arisen de novo from non-coding DNA, the author went on to acknowledge that invoking this mechanism poses a severe problem for evolutionary theory since it doesn't really explain the origin of any of its non-trivial requirements for functionality. Clearly, one cannot solve a problem or refute an argument by failing to address it. Protein folds, plausible but irrelevant scenarios. There is a second and closely related uh, difficulty associated with the scenarios cited by Long. Typically, they do not even try to explain the origin of new protein folds. And few of them analyze genes different enough from each other that their protein products could even conceivably exemplify different folds. <coughs> protein folds, relevant but implausible scenarios. In a few cases, the devolutionary scenario cited in the long paper appear to be attempts to explain genes that are different enough from each other that they could conceivably code for proteins with different folds. For example, Long discusses several papers that equate exon shuffling with the shuffling of protein domains. Thus, at the very least, the exon shuffling hypothesis presupposes the prior existence of a significant amount of genetic information, enough information to build an independent protein domain or fold. As such, it fails as an explanation for the origin of protein folds and the information necessary to produce them. All this requires searching for a functional needle in a vast haystack of combinatorial possibilities. Recall that Douglas Sachs estimated the ratio of needles, functional sequences, to strands of straw in the haystack or non-functional sequences to be about 1 to 10 to the 77th for sequences of modest length amino acids. And if you want a little bit more of an idea of what that means, it means that approximately 60% of the amino acids could be allowed to vary completely, but the other 40%, I think it's 38% or something, 39%, um, have to be exactly correct. So, uh, for 150, that would be about 60, maybe 59 that had to be exactly correct, whereas the rest of them didn't. 
Now, in fact, what's really happening is that some of them have to be exactly correct. Some of them can vary between one or two amino acids. Some of them can vary five amino acids. Some of them can be all over the place. So it's, um, that's more like what's really going on. But, but the f in terms of mathematical probability, it can be thought of as 40% need to be exactly correct. The assertion of Long and his colleagues about exon shuffling, like many other statements about postulated mutational mechanisms, blurs the distinction between theory and evidence. The papers that Long cites offer neither mathematical demonstration nor experimental evidence of the power of these mechanisms to produce significant gains in biological information. In other words, these people that are relying on Long's article, he thinks they're relying on a man of straw, if you please. In fairness, neo-Darwinian biologists have mathematical models of their own, models indicating to them that nearly <coughs> unlimited evolutionary change can occur under the right conditions. The assumptions that these models, which are based on the equations of population genetics, accurately represent how much evolution can occur, has left many evolutionary biologists confident in the creative power of various mutational mechanisms. But should they be? In the next chapter, I'll try to take up this question. So come back next week and we'll discuss that. As I do, I'll explain why evolutionary biologists have been heretofore untroubled by mathematical challenges to neo-Darwinism. I'll also show why that has begun to change as new developments in molecular genetics have introduced another formidable mathematical challenge to the creative power of the neo-Darwinian mechanism, a challenge that arises from within the neo-Darwinian framework those are his italics, and raises yet new questions about the causal adequacy of the neo-Darwinian mechanism. Now, my take on all this real quickly, I think that it seems to me that Douglas Axe has finished the job of demonstrating that functional sequences uh, or even folded proteins are rare compared to non-functional, that should be obviously an O, or unfolded sequences. To get where it needs to be to supply at least most of the information for a Cambrian complex life form, a protein has to make, has to have a very specified and highly unlikely configuration. It also seems to me that the article that was so persuasive to Meyer's detractors isn't nearly good enough to effectively destroy his thesis. I plan to look at the long paper and Gishlik's et al. Uh, and Gishlik et al.'s response. Um, after we get done with the book, we're going to go over a few of the really key questions, and I think this is one of them. There is another paper that is being recommended that we will scrutinize that basically argues that creationists, under whom ideas usually included by these people, misunderstand and misuse the primary literature most of the time. And I'll introduce that at the appropriate time. Um, I, I say, see this coming week, um, Meyer has already dived deep into one of their prize papers uh, with interesting results. But that's my take. Now it's your turn. That one? Comment? We have seven minutes before uh, 1130, so. Pardon me. Um, I'm going to hand that back to her. I'm sorry, would you explain a little bit more about the orphan genes? About the? Orphans. I'm, I'm sorry. Orphans. Orphan. Orphan. Oh, okay. Orphan. Well, it's open reading frame. When you take a, uh, I don't know that there is such a thing as a random stretch of DNA, uh, unless we make it, but if you take a non-specified part of a, an organism's DNA and look at it. 
um, there are ways of translating it into protein. But as you get along, th three out of the 64 codes are what they call stop codons. And so you're translating it along and you get to a stop codon. And if you were translating that into, from RNA into protein, the protein would stop at 10. Okay, well, there aren't any really 10 amino acid proteins. It takes much longer than that. I think um, you can see a few of them at about 75 or so, uh, a few more at 100, a few more at 150, lysyl oxidase is 400. There's some of them that run in the thousands. So if you're translating along and you have a stop code on a 10, that's probably not a protein. And you have to have a, there's a specific one that they all start with too. And that's methionine, kind of interestingly. And so what you can do is you can go through, oh, here's a methionine one. Well, let's see if we translate that up oh, five, we quit. Then that's not a protein. But what happens if you keep going and keep going and keep going? Um, the chances of things stopping by themselves you know, if things were random, which of course they're not, uh, would be 3 in 64, which is approximately 1 in 21. So every w if, if you're just, you know, running random sequences, every 21 times you'd have a stop, uh, which means that you're really not likely to see something that's, you know, if you get 100 of them, if you get 150 of them, if you get 400 of them, you start thinking, well, maybe this is actually a protein that's being coded for. So that's what they mean by open reading frame. They're looking at the DNA and they're saying, this could be a protein. Now, is it? They don't know. They just, they just sequence this DNA and who knows what it is. Maybe that's just chance and that's the way it is. Maybe, on the other hand, this is a new undiscovered protein. Um, and, I, you know, some people will find an op open reading frame, well, what kind of protein does it produce? Does it make any sense? Could this be a new protein? And they might look for protein sequences and see if one of them matches this. They might look for... Uh, uh, they might look for, uh, one of the things that, that probably should be done, and I'm sure has been done somewhere, is because people have come up with this idea any number of times, is to produce, let's say, 10 or 20 of those amino acids, um, make antibodies against that particular protein sequence, and then see whether you can localize the protein that the antibodies climb onto. Um, at this point, we're kind of peering through a glass darkly, but every once in a while it clears up a little more. Uh, but an orphan gene is one that they don't know, that, that it looks like it should be a protein. But for example, it's found only in rabbits and is not found in mice or rats or, or sheep or other animals. So it's an orphan in the sense that it doesn't have any parents that gave birth to it. So that's why the open reading frame kind of stuck as orphan is, you know, if you have one, let's say, let's say you have one in humans and there are, I think, s we went over that, like either 20 or 60 families of orphan genes in humans. Um, which means this orphan gene is pretty similar to that one, so maybe they could have descended from the same gene. But the whole, the whole gene family is unique to humans. There's no chimpanzee genes that look like they could have descended from the same ancestor. There's no gorilla genes. There's no uh, rhesus monkey genes. There's no mouse genes that match. And, you know, in mice and in, in, in humans, we have the actual complete uh, DNA. So it's not like, well, maybe if we keep looking, we'll find it. 
that is you can exhaustively search certain genomes and know that it's not there. Does that help any? No, in answering your question, I'm sure I'm answering the question of a lot of people, so don't feel badly about asking it. Um, we have another question over here. Uh, I think if we um, consider that to get an uh, organism evolved into another, we have a much more big problem in that you have to coordinate a lot of those. The whole paper here has been about one gene, but uh, think how much of a more difficult problem it is to coordinate however many, like a thousand genes it might take to uh, <clears throat> explain how uh, uh, one of these new organisms is different than its supposed ancestor. That's, uh, that's a problem that we uh, can't even completely, well, we're, we're just beginning to address at all. That is, what is the original organism that through one pathway would have gotten you hallucinogenia, through another pathway would have gotten you uh, trilobites, through a third pathway would get you starfish, and through a fourth pathway would get you fish. Uh, and are the intermediates viable? We certainly don't find them in the fossil record. So I agree with you, it's a problem, uh, and it's one that hasn't been solved. Any, any other questions or comments? Oh, just a minute. Uh, there's a mic for you right there. Well, it seemed to me as I was looking out there, it means to pretty much rule out. Well, one could draw that conclusion, and I don't think one would be completely uh, crazy for doing so. Um, we have a comment here and one down here. You want to pass that mic? Go ahead. Yeah, this is pretty tough reading. <laughs> I've had one class in organic chemistry, and that's before they knew very much about DNA. So I'm just wondering about impact, because uh, unless you really understand a topic, you're not very likely to accept all the findings unless the person is very trustworthy and I think Stephen Meyer is very trustworthy. He's got excellent credentials. Can you speculate on what kind of impact will filter down to the average American uh, mm. in a book like this? I'm a librarian so I kind of want to see what the impact factor is. That's librarian terminology. I think that this is one of those cases where um, at present uh, the ethos of evolutionary biology seems to be that biology must be made safe for atheists. This is not safe for atheists. And therefore, even though I think there's some very, very good arguments, and there's some shorter and more strong arguments, in fact, that can be made, uh, having watched all this, once you clear all of the debris out of the way, the people who are arguing around this little tiny point and that little tiny point, which are really irrelevant to the central thesis, uh, and once you clear out the, well, who's credible and who's not kind of stuff, that the final result is that we can believe in human designers. But in fact, disembodied designers 
are a non-starter. And so what it boils down to basically is we don't want to believe in God. And you can't get through that. Because until somebody decides it's God, uh, that they want to believe in God, it's, uh, there's no way you can argue around it. And I think if we get to where we can clarify the discussion to where that question becomes the question that we're dealing with, uh, then we've probably done all that we reasonably can. So there needs to be a book, God is a, a Molecular Biologist. <laughs> uh, you know, that would be interesting. It obviously isn't going to be put out by the Discovery Institute because they, as a policy, don't discuss who the designer is. And that's for a very simple reason. They know that the instant they go there, people will say, but that's not science. As if whether it was science mattered. You see, you can't put God in a test tube, you can't test him, you can't whatever, you know. Um, and, and so the whole thrust of it is to keep God out of science to keep even the indication that God would solve neatly a problem that is not soluble at present out of the discussion. And that's why Meyer's paper was not answered. It was made to disappear. The Jedi Knight this is not the paper you are looking for. Uh, can you pass a, just a minute, just a minute. We're going to get you on tape here. Go ahead. Now, how is this going to affect the common people out there? I think that's what he was asking. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm a common person. I'm an English major. Mm -hmm. I do not understand all the science on this thing, but I read his book. And it's interesting because even as somebody coming from the humanities, I can see truth in it. The whole idea of context made a lot of sense to me, you know, because that's, that's in humanities, that's in reading texts. So there were things in the book that, that made sense to me, even though I don't understand all that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, th I think it's a persuasive book, and I think it will reach a lot more people than understand everything that's going on. You don't have to understand it all. That's correct. Um, I think that its its impact, in one sense, will be limited to people who are willing to accept it. Now, I think that the interesting thing of it is that may cover a substantial majority of the um, of the American population, in particular, because, as I understand it, there's. Uh, about 40% of people that believe that mankind was created as special less than 10,000 years ago. There's about another 35%, depending on which poll you read, that says that man came from a long process when God guided the process. Both of those people will be willing to listen to this. Um, there's about, it depends on the poll, somewhere between 9 and 15 percent of the population that say man came, came from a long process, evolution obviously, and God had nothing to do with it. This book will not impact them, uh, or more precisely, if it does impact them, it will impact them precisely the wrong way. Because if you don't want to go there, nobody's going to make you. On the other hand, what it will do is it will allow people who are in the science field who don't want to just throw out science completely, but who don't have really any arguments to make themselves feel comfortable challenging what is the majority position in evolutionary biology today, to do that challenging and to live their lives ignoring the demands of that group. And I think that's what it will do. Now, how many that is, um, I will have to confess, 
that when I was in medical school and when I was in graduate school, both times I flunked my course in prophecy. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> uh, has Axe done any um, of his mathematical projections when the sequence is longer than 100? He was citing 150 and he came up with 10 to the 77th. So what happens when it's 1,000 or something like that? Um, no. Uh, the reason why he picked that was because it was a size that you could go in and you could change this uh, uh, piece of RNA or this piece of DNA to produce more RNA to produce more protein that would give you a different protein. And that's pretty tedious and expensive work. Um, and, you know, you get grants to study one paper. Now, are you going to get a grant to do one with a thousand? Probably not. So, um, I, I think there are natural limits to, you know, how much you, you're going to get out of that kind of a study. You know, they'll do it, f they'll do it for one paper because it's groundbreaking. Uh, they might do it for another paper because it's testing. But if you're going to do a whole bunch of Me Too experiments, they'll figure they have better places to put their money. So then... Besides well, that, who wants to fund more of Douglas Axe's work considering where it went? Well, exactly. <laughs> but, so if uh, he was uh, citing the uh, bacteria, total number of life, 10 to the 40th, and he subtracted that out. But if um, that would have been just based on one sequence on, on one particular protein, but like how many proteins would the bacteria have? It's got to have more than one. So what would the real number end up being? Well, as you can imagine, the real number starts to climb uh, hugely, or, or more precisely, to uh, decrease hugely. Uh, at some point, you run out of all of the resources in the universe. I mean, there are only 10 to the 80th organ, uh, particles in the entire universe or so. And m maybe it's 10 to 81. I mean, who cares, you know? Um, and, um, you know, there's, I mean, people don't realize this, but the entire life of the planet is less than 10 to the 29th uh, seconds. And then, uh, uh, and then, and then, uh, 10 to the minus 43 seconds or something like that is the Planck time, which is the time it takes for light to go across a nucleus. Which is to say that is the smallest time possible that can be measured. So, you know, you multiply those out and you come to a number that's around 10 to the 150 or so which is why Dembski said it is universal probability bound. That is to say, if you turn the entire universe into nothing more than probability filtering devices, which is, of course, crazy, because stars are not probability force, uh, yeah. filtering devices. But, uh, you know, uh, ten to, if you had less than 10 to the 150, you're, you're in total deep weeds range. And so, yeah, if you have, okay, 10 to the 39 for one protein, let's supposing that for the 1,000 protein it's the same, which is, of course, crazy. Um, then you have, um, uh, 10 to the 39, which is cheating anyway, because we've, the 10 to the 40 organisms is included in that 10 150, right? So, well, you, to look at it this way. If you, if you realize that, then when you have 10 to, the 27, uh, 10 to the 77th for one, 10 to the 77th for the next one, you're at 10 to the 140, 154. You're already over the universal probability bound right there. <laughs> so, no, if people run the numbers, they realize that there's no way this happens on its own. So that's why they're didn't even bother to try to publish something yeah. against it. And the funniest part is, in talk origins, 
there is actually a piece that says you can't do those calculations. Not this, they start out by the creation of getting this all, getting this all wrong. Um, they make this mistake and that mistake and another mistake. And when you get done, you're thinking, okay, and we're going to hear how you do it for real. No, when it gets done, it says, you can't do that. And the reason why is because if you do it with any kind of halfway reasonable assumptions, pure chance loses, and they know it. So the strategy is to keep it off the table just the same way the strategy was to keep that paper off the table. And the only reply that ever got in was on a blog post, you know, which isn't official. It's total dead silence on the subject. Because if you play, you lose. So what you do is you don't play. Do creationists to keep, it, to keep things off the table, too? I suppose it depends on the creationist. Okay. I think creationists sometimes will tell you, and I think with good reason, that they don't have all the answers. Right. Uh, the, the one that's probably this, the biggest trouble that I think of for the creationists right now is the heat problem of uh, what do you do with all the heat that would be caused by the flood. The heat problem. Okay. Uh, and most of the time they'll say, we, we don't know. And you'll hear some interesting speculations. Of course, if you got th this is the frustrating part for their side. If you've got a God there and he needs to get rid of the heat, he just does. So what you wind up with is, you know, you can't really pin a creationist down completely. And that's one of the, it, and, it, and in fairness, it's true. I mean, if you, if you have a God, God can do what he wants, and you may or may not see anything that really helps you. Uh, and so, in a sense, it's asymmetric warfare, and they're kind of half right in complaining that it's not fair. But on the other hand, they're the ones that don't want a God around, so they think they can explain it, and as we're getting into more and more of the details, you can't explain it that way. It's a failure. Well, but if you give us another 20 years and another 3 million in uh, endowment funds to look at this, maybe we'll come up with something, which basically turns into the kind of the evolution of the gaps. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll find something someday. Uh, and that's why, in, in one sense, it's a philosophical question. Right. If we can get it back to a philosophical question rather than a scientific question, I think we'll be making progress. Because what's do being done right now is we're scientists, you're religionists, you're wrong. Do you know the, um, let's see, I forget his last name, Art, the geologist at Southwestern Chadwick. University? Chadwick. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You know, he says the best we can do is balance this out. You know, they've got problems and we've got problems. As he's satisfied as long as we keep it at that, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, in certain areas, it's not just balancing out. Yeah, right. It seems that and, way. And in the, in the area of the origin of life, and now it looks like in the area of the origin of the yeah. Cambrian phyla, it's getting tougher. Yeah. Anyway... Come back next week. We'll uh, uh, continue the discussion.